In this episode, a 90s classic, Peter Bagg's Hate, Tom Spurgeon joins Kumar and me to break down a work that was hailed as a comic for the slacker generation. Is that an accurate way of thinking about it? First, don't forget that your pledge via Patreon helps keep the show going. Check out our goals and rewards and make your pledge at patreon.com slash deconcomics, or send a one-time donation of any amount via PayPal at donate at deconstructingcomics.com. We appreciate your support. This is Tim. This is Kumar. Hey, this is Tom. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo with Kumar in Melbourne and Tom Spurgeon in Columbus, Ohio. How's everybody doing? Great. I'm cold and wet. <laughs> you know, my mailman is just has taken. I have the worst mailman. I have like a comedy mailman. Like if, I, if this were a sitcom, I would have episodes about my mailman. And uh, the mailman dropped a bunch of comics. Oh, no. At a neighbor's house, like two blocks away, just in the yard. <laughs> so I'm trying to tr- dry out like these weird comics. Uh, it's terrible. Yeah. So that's how I am. And what a fun thing to do on an evening in the middle of winter, in the endless winter of 2018. <laughs> um, um, so I'm glad to talk to you guys. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah, it has. I don't remember the last time the three of us did one. Um but yeah, so uh, we decided to get together and talk about Peter Bagg's hate. This is something that's been on our list to do for just like years and years. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, for a long time, it was kind of tag, do this one with Tom. Um, and then uh, last year, Coombe did an interview with Peter Bagg, uh, episode 545. And I listened to that last night, actually. And that was almost entirely about... Uh, Peter's newer work, and there wasn't an awful lot in it about hate, so I don't think we're really overlapping with that one. Um, so yeah, now um, Tom, th- th- this was published by Fantagraphics, and I g- think it over overlaps with your time there. Did d- did you have any involvement with it? No, I had absolutely no involvement with the actual production of the comic, and was kind of not. Um, on the comics production side of things, the the best that the journal guys could hope for back then was to be allowed to like have access to the what was then uh, a much smaller archives program. So like, I briefly edited some Pogo books and worked on a little Orphan Annie volume that I don't think ever <laughs> was published. And uh, but no, I, I didn't get to stand near the the. Um, didn't get to get near the comic from a production standpoint, but certainly it was a huge factor because it was, I mean, I got there in 94, the comic started in 1990, so it was really like hitting its stride in terms of, I think, maximizing its popularity and that confluence of Pete starting a comic set in Seattle in 1990, uh-huh. um, about young people, um, the slacker generation, and the whole kind of media interest in not just alternative culture, but alternative culture set in Seattle, mm-hmm. um, kind of made it a, a huge kind of factor. It was literally, you know, one of the comics I most looked forward to when one would come through the house. I would look at the art as it would come in. Uh, Jim Blanchard, who was the inker in the second half of the book, was uh, in the office at the time and was a a great person. It was colored there in the office. And Peter and Jim Woodring within Seattle comics culture were kind of the twin dads of the culture. You know, even though like they would, I have to be like a decade older than they are, than they were now. You know, like I'm, I'm, but these guys were probably in their late 30s, but they were both successful cartoonists, uh, a little bit older than the kind of um, uh, the main group of, of Seattle cartoonists. And they were both, um, you know, really smart, really nice men that kind of took care. And, you know, if it, visitors would come to their houses. They had the big parties. Um, Pete's house especially was very aspirational for a lot of cartoonists because it, it seemed like this... Um, 
kind of ideal comics existence. You know, he had a little family and this beautiful little house in Ballard. And that was the way that we all wanted, that, that all the cartoonists wanted to end up with the successful series um, moving into trades and with opportunities to do um, maybe some television film work. So you know, Peter was a huge, huge deal. And I, I still think he's a huge deal. I think, you know, I, I, I'm a, a gigantic Peter Bag fan of all of his work. But I think, you know, Hate is a comic so of its time that I think it doesn't get the play as uh, how big it was. Um, it, it's hard to appreciate now even how big it was in the moment. It was right up there with um, Eight Ball and Love and Rockets and a, a new that new guy, Chris Ware, as kind of the titans of alt comics culture um no yummy fur also chester brown and julie Doucet. you know but it was right in that handful and probably sold better than all of those comics at the time mm. so it was a big big factor um it was also you know the first trade was a big deal kind of limited and it's kind of funny the reason why um kind of buddy bradley slouching through seattle um in the old days before fanographics had a store you could go to the warehouse, wherever they had the warehouse located. And one of the things you could do at the warehouse is buy dinged up copies for um, half price. So I would imagine that, you know, a couple thousand young people in Seattle got from a friend or someone else or, you know, people that just knew someone in Seattle got, got copies of this trade because, you know, Peter has such a dense kind of funny style. It was a really good book to give and it was really cheap and they had a lot of um we had a lot of access to it so it's a wholly different time but yeah pete was a big deal and, and i found pete kind of endlessly entertaining just as a person so um i was i was a fanboy now was this big published time. as a like a magazine or was it like a regular marvel dc size comic book How, what was the kind of publication was it well, you know, Peter came from, and the character Buddy Bradley, around whom hate was oriented, came from a magazine size, like a lo like Love and Rockets original run, uh, neat or stuff. Elfquest. But so, yeah, it was neat stuff, and that was a magazine size book. So all of his characters, and that was one of four or five prominent features there. It was kind of a one man anthology that Pete did, and he had, he had Chet and Bunny Leeway and the radio host Studs Kirby, and a Martin bunch of Baton. really good skills. What's that, Kumar? Um, I was saying Martini Baton was another one, yeah. another character in Neat Stuff. Yeah, and that, Martini Baton actually, I think, precedes Neat Stuff and was a student um, kind of thing that he did when he was on the East Coast in small press magazines. But yeah, all of these characters uh, had a kind of a presence in this rollicking anthology. And so um, the Bradleys were one of the features, and Buddy Bradley was kind of the main focus of the Bradleys features. The Bradleys were uh, really just straight up kind of a proto Simpsons um, and, you know, very much kind of a, 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 a dysfunctional suburban family kind of in the midst of combat. And Peter did a couple really good Buddy Bradley comics in there. And I think it was really obvious that, that Buddy had breakout power. So he debuted um, Hate and Hate ran all 30 issues in comic book size format. So that was, that was considered, it was kind of considered, um, a very 90s thing that the 80s kind of had this magazine form format but except for a couple of titles it didn't really work comic stores wanted to rack these comics with the other comics and so all 30 issues of hate uh one through 15 in black and white and 16 to 30 in color were, were comic book size and he even detailed some of the process like kind of how they ended up there in humorous fashion in the, the Hate Island strips where it depicts Peter talking to, Ken, you know, uh, bizarre, fantastical, but not too far um, from the norm, uh, versions of Gary Groth and Ken Thompson about kind of the, uh, you know, kind of landing on this, on, on Buddy Bradley as kind of a classic everyman character. I didn't know that Fantagraphics published any, like, comic book size comics. Other, you know, usually I think of magazines or trade paperbacks or hardcovers, but were you know, they, they really, they, they really did. You know, a lot of their, you know, Dalgoda, uh, there's a lot of their science fiction titles. Usagi, uh, Yojimbo was a, a regular comic size comic. So they did have a, a, a comic that was, 
you know, eight ball always ran at that, um, at the, at the comic book size. But I, so I think they're of two minds, but you know, the, the shift to kind of doing their hardcore alt stuff as rackable on the main racks, I think really solidified with hate. And certainly it, it, it was successful, I think for kind of that choice of format. I think it, if it, if it had been in that oversized format up by the cashier, you know, I'm not sure that it would have kind of found uh, the wider audience it did um, uh, during the kind of height of its run. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering why he called it hate um, in the. So I, I read it in the the three big volumes. Uh, sure. Buddy does Seattle. Buddy does Jersey, and and uh, Buddy buys a dump. Um, and in the foreword of the first one, uh, Bag says that he shamelessly and inexplicably titled it "Hate." Um, so, the yeah, story I've heard hmm. is that um, he originally thought it may be "Love and Hate," but then there was already "Love and Rockets," and it mm. sounded too similar, and he didn't want to call it "Love," so he just called it "Hate." <laughs> right. You know, the the one thing I remember about the title was that you know there was an appearance of one of the issues in the film Kids, which was very controversial about um, kind of the sex lives of these teenage, aimless sex lives and walking around and, and lives of these kids. And I remember that was a, one of the reviewers said, you know, these kids are so hardcore, even the comics they read are, are called hate. You know, that was, <laughs> that was uh, but it certainly kind of popped on the stands. And, you know, titles were weird back then, at least, you know, like a lot of the titles sounded straight up like porno. Um, you know, I mean, fur, <laughs> Slut Burger, you know, Mary Fleener's <laughs> title. There were, um, so, I, you know, Eight Ball has a kind of a sleazy drug connotation. So I think that's kind of the old, um, the underground kind of press in that. And, you know, that's also something that Pete had a background um, in. Of course, he was an editor of Weirdo Magazine and appeared in there, which was the West Coast half of the West Coast, East Coast art comics battle of the 1980s which was weirdo versus raw mm. and so pete you know is was uh you know he has his under late underground kind of um um a kind of a, a legitimacy and i you know I, so i just think it was a funny title and i think he, he put on it i don't know i don't have a story i don't honestly know why he did that but i assume that he just kind of noodled and it felt right and they went forward um it's kind of funny sometimes how how uh, something works, but it it does work, and you know it's also very different than than neat stuff in terms of its tone, which was more you know ironic. Um, so maybe that was also a a, a, a way to kind of. Uh, but yes, that is a comic called Hate, and I, I you know there was some blowback, but not you know eventually I think everyone just kind of accepted it, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. I honestly don't have a talk. I don't. I don't have a story. But the love and hate thing sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, yes. Well, I I was kind of wondering what how accurate it is to call this an underground comic. Since I mean, I don't under what's the, what's the definition of underground? I mean, if it comes out from an established publisher like Fantagraphics, can it be called underground? Certainly, there's kind of an underground aesthetic to it and, you know, people having sex and doing drugs and whatever and the art style itself. But uh, I don't, what do you guys think? I think it's uh, really, well, I, do, I never heard it called underground, alternative certainly, but okay. when you get back to New Jersey, it's really a sitcom mm. and it's almost, and when he goes to color and Buddy's shirt is the same color every issue, um, there is a real kind of sitcom feel to it like it's almost the same thing now there's a little bit of there is a progressive plot there but um there's some issues like the where it's like the men versus the women or the one where buddy has to take his uh nephew and niece out for the whole day and like that's the whole issue mm -hmm. uh where i felt like the writing he he was really the the wheels were well greased and he knew exactly what he's doing and he was really on fire, and he knew how to just kind of do it uh, almost on autopilot. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. I mean, he he was pumping out really perfect stories at that stage. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, to me, in that respect, it seems really almost mainstream. Um, mm. I mean, it, it's not because of all the 
the cursing and the very weird art style, which I love with the rubbery joints uh, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Everybody's Reed um, Richards. Yeah, and the, <laughs> yeah, and the and you know all the sex and there is still the drugs and there's a great storyline about how uh, they try to turn Buddy's mom's house into a crack house. <laughs> um, and so it's, in that sense, it's not it's not mainstream at all. But I feel like something about the format, and I've never seen anybody else before or since do a comic book in sitcom as a sitcom. Like you see it in newspaper strips, but nobody has done it before or since that I can think of, really. Yeah, you're right. I think it does kind of stand alone. It's not even you know the the. You, I think that the proper way is to is you can recognize the elements of underground comics that find a continuity, and, and that it was satirical, and it's satirical of a kind of um, culture. One thing that that Pete shares in common with Robert Crumb is that he mistrusts both the squares and the hipsters, kind of with equal <laughs> hatred and contempt. Um, but I, you know, it was really when it came out, there was a whole the word alternative as kind of a way to present this kind of entertainment. You know, it had wider cultural implications because, you know, Pulp Fiction had broken in a way that was very mainstream, but the content of it seemed very, you know, kind of out there and bizarre as compared to what had come before, you know, a film, uh, you know, a film like Working Girl or Bugsy. Um, Pulp Fiction was very different, but very popular, and there was, seemed to be a way with the music and the kind of way films going that there would be comics that would dive into this kind of uh, freer expression and kind of adult expression and still have this satirical edge, but would be seen as kind of a form of, of uh, you know, a choice to be made within mainstream entertainment, and you know, that was, there was all the ridiculous things that you can imagine when that became a buzzword. I remember DC Comics running an ad that was sort of like, you know, welcome to the real alternative. And it was like Star Trek comics and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and something was different. And also, you know, alternative had a, a, a functional use within comics um, to di differentiate itself, differentiate the comics under that umbrella from um, mainstream superhero comics, which were still the dominant form and the dominant sales form. And one of the kind of lasting legacies of hate was that it came at a time when those comics experienced enough of a downturn that hate outsold some mainstream comics, which was considered, you know, now, now, we're, now we talk about mainstream comics that sell, you know, three or 4,000. But back then, one of the primary features of, of comics from, you know, Daredevil and X-Men and stuff like that was that they always sold a certain high number. And this is, you know, there's a free fall in the early 90s where, you know, a Rob Liefeld comic in, you know, 94 might sell fewer copies than a Peter Bagg comic. And this was mind-blowing to the comics culture um, where the previous kind of... Um, Thinking, the thinking of, of a lot of comics fans in the early 90s was that the comic book store was an idealized marketplace, and everything that sold in the comic store was in direct proportion to what America wanted. And so as the alternative comics came out, and Peter's book would sell in a lot of different shops, it sold in record stores, it sold a, had a, a pretty good um, mail order arm, it sold internationally, um, that that... Um, wasn't necessarily true that um, that the that the the great hierarchy of great selling superhero comics and then pitiful selling everything else was true anymore. So it became more of a wild west. It became at least in the lower frontier of it, where you could have a comic that was um, successful as well as kind of um, out there and kind of um, critical of of modern culture. Um, and that was the kind of, and now we don't think about that, you know, like you know, people like, uh, people working in kids comics, like Raina Telgemeier just crush the comic sales of, of some mainstream comics. And there are certainly, um, you know, book, um, especially in the book market and collected, you know, uh, graphic novels that just sell, um, wonder, you know, I'd rather have, um, uh, my, uh, Durf Bacter's sales than, you know, your average kind of um, 
uh, lower, you know, the, whoever the equivalent of Sal Buscema is these days, you know, like, <laughs> the, the kind of the, you know, kind of the, the, the kind of stock mainstream guy, because there's, but back then that was considered really weird. And bag and bags comic was a, um, a certainly an eye opener in terms of what comics could do within a certain culture. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, boy, where do we go from here? Uh, <laughs> Kumar, you have a direction to go? I, yeah, I don't know. can I ask you guys a question? Yeah. Did you notice, I mean, this is something that people know, that it kind of took a while for people to notice early on, but there's definitely a, did you guys notice like the parallels to Archie right away in the cast? <laughs> no. Mm, no, I didn't think about if that either. Think about it, because if you think about it, you can draw a pretty quick comparison with, <laughs> well. with Buddy being Archie, Stinky being Reggie, wow. George Cecil Hamilton the third being the oddball Jughead, um, Val Val Valerie's Bay, Veronica. Veronica it's Leavenworth. Oh my head. God! Um, and in, in a lot of ways, I think it's a really interesting way to look at the kind of um, narrative propulsion of those stories. But Lisa because, is you know, Betty. Like people wandering in and out of scenes, like they they wander into a scene where you know, um, or you know, like Stinky walks in naked, you know, while they're eating spaghetti dinner. Yeah. And it's like that's not too different, except for the fact that Reggie didn't have. Um, sores on his penis um but it's not that different than the way kind of the narratives of archie comics move along wow. it's like oh it's, they keep running into like these same characters over and over again and they have kind of a web of relationships <laughs> wow so i don't know I, i've always found that kind of fascinating that it that it had that structure which wasn't you know now we appreciate archie's structure a lot more than i think we did in 1992 um and it's kind of a, an effective way to to cast out your comic, but um, yeah, that was that was something that kind of dawned on people. I think as the as the as those early issues continued. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I'd be really interested in knowing from you guys is what you thought of the shift to color, which was uh, and the move back to Jersey, which was mm. well hugely now, controversial at the time. If if, if yeah. If, well, reading it in the version that I did, um, the Jersey stuff, it, it, the forward says that it was published in color originally, but for some reason it was black and white in the book. So oh, I couldn't weird. really... Uh, now, the, the 21st century stuff from the annuals uh, yeah. is in color in the in the Buddy Buys a Dump. But, uh, yeah, I couldn't quite experience the, the color shift at the appropriate time. Kumar, what, what form did you read it in? Well, I uh, I had a long history with it, so I think the first issue I ever bought of Hate was number five, which is the one where they go over to that collector's house and go through his magazine bins, mm. and then <laughs> Buddy comes home and he goes on a rampage against Valerie and Lisa for no real reason, except that he's Buddy. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of the end of the issue. And then I didn't come back to it until later. I can't remember exactly, but I do remember that huge controversy about switching to color because it seemed like some people thought he was selling out. Um, yeah. But it was it's like it's like the Wizard of Oz when it switches to color because he's, <laughs> he's in a different world. He's in New Jersey, and and like I said, the yellow shirt made all the difference. Like that to me was a it's kind of a signifier of something that the the whole tone had shifted. Um, but I I I love both halves of it. Um, and I don't think the, like, I know about this, I have the old five issues per trade set, right, and I sure. don't have the, the new ones with, like, 15 in them, so I've never read it in black and white, I can't imagine reading the New Jersey stories in black and white, it's, to me, it's, the, it really pops off the page, and I think, I think it almost, although I never made that Archie connection, it almost brings more of that traditional cartooning, and you know, every time they someone does a flop tape where you only see their feet in the panel because somebody said something crazy, <laughs> I mean, that works better in color. All those kind of traditional cartooning things, somehow my brain is wired to associate with color, and I just felt like it worked so perfectly. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, the, the big changes that he made at the time, there, there were basically four of them, which one was that he added the color... Two is that Jim Blanchard started yes. inking him, and Jim is an incredibly funny and um, formidable character of kind of of, of, North, of Northwest culture period. He's a, a really skilled um, portrait um, um, artist, 
and um, it's quite. They even at one point late in the run, they did a they did a tribute comics about him, in which it's all like Blanchard, you know, insulting children until they cry. Um, and after after that issue, even better is in the next issue where he basically calls all of the stories lies um, in his response to the tribute issue about him. But Jim is a great human being, but he's also a really interesting kind of professional anchor and i think that it loosens up that work quite a bit it becomes a little bit more dynamic and lovely just because jim's inking it there was yes. the plot change where they go to jersey and that was considered you know why would you abandon the rich font of of uh, people's people's continuing interest in seattle culture for jersey in which you know this is way before jersey shore so there's no interest in jersey <laughs> at the time and then he and then he also wanted to rotate some you know backups and work with some people and eventually worked with you know, like Crum and and Alan Moore on short stories uh, which accompanied it and was inked um, you know by Eric Reynolds on some of those backup stories as well. So it was really kind of a a shift, right? I mean, it was, and I I, I just I. I always think of it, you know, it's kind of like the, you know, kind of like a TV show in peak TV where there's that radical shift between seasons and people flip out a little bit. But looking back on it, it's like I can't imagine if he had not yeah. made that made that move because I think that some of those comics and some of the like specific observations, just that crew of just like the suburban neighborhood losers that he hangs out with. And, you know, yes. It's just yeah. amazing. Um, like you just could not cast anything as funny and kind of accurate as um, kind of small town suburban goofballs than that. And I, so I think it actually kind of sharpened his 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 um, satirical chops that kind of have a bigger target to go on. And a lot of them were memorable scenes and um, take place later on. Um, and you know, like his mom is a great character in in the later run. So I, you know, I, but I, it's, it was interesting, like how precious to some people and how, like all comics and all serial, like people held it, that they were really concerned about um, <laughs> what was going to happen um, in, in later issues of the, of the publication. Um, yeah, I thought yeah. The, yeah, the shift to Jersey was, I mean, a little different, but it wasn't better or worse. I mean, it well, certainly I wasn't worse than the Seattle stuff. I think it's interesting that the the point of being kind of locked into the suburbs forced the supporting cast to be more permanent. Um, That's because I question. think I think yeah. in Seattle's characters kind of come in and out, and there's a character Jay who was in the early Neat Stuff Bradley stories, and he comes back, and people become kind of permanent. Like they're these kind of walk on characters, like Jake the Snake and Pencils kind of become part of the permanent losers that he's stuck. He can't... Because the, the, one of the things I really love is how Buddy is kind of the same one out of everybody. Like, he's the most... He's the one you can kind of identify with because everybody else is so crazy. But he's totally stuck with them. He can't escape their orbit. Jimmy Foley lives next door and is always hanging out over that fence, bugging him every time he walks out of the house. Like, there's... And that I feel like in the Seattle stuff, it's a little bit more chaotic. Like, yeah, people kind of come and go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, one interesting thing about the comic overall is that Peter was not writing his age group, so that a lot of the comic becomes a um, kind of observational things that he was seeing in Seattle people um, and people. There was a. A kind of a, a famous uh, fanographics house that was about two blocks from Peter, in which a lot of the young people kind of processed through um, initially when they moved to Seattle. So he had a lot of material to look at um, there. Uh, I think some of Lisa's personality comes from a, a former fanographics employee named Helena Harvelitz, <laughs> who was kind of famously strange. And there's some of the autobio comics kind of un kind of take on her. Um, her more directly, but she was she was someone that Pete could see. But at the same time, you know, he had had those kinds of experiences when he was a younger man. And I do think, like looking back on it, it does seem like an older person's view of that. I can I it would not it would not surprise me if I knew nothing about the comic to find out that Peter was you know a decade older than the people he was at best. Um, the, the people that he was he was going after. He do, it does seem to have that removed to it. It does seem to have mm. this strange wisdom to yes. it. And I think mm -hmm. I I think that comes out a little bit. You know, 
Buddy himself is a really interesting character because he's not, you know, the people around him are less normal <laughs> than he is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like he is a, he's not a blank slate. Oh yeah. Like some characters that play that role where you never really get a view a kind of grasp on the central character. They seem like an empty suit and he's not, um, not always wholly admirable himself. And I, I find that character really interesting because of his kind of, um, there is not, it's not a warm character. There's not a lot of affection that comes from Buddy. It's not that thing where it's like, oh, these people, these wacky people, but they're my people. It's like he, you know, that 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 vision of him kind of painted into a corner in that person's house reading comics and muttering about the Great Pussy Wars. I mean, that's that's a very <laughs> specific kind of of world, you know, act of worldview, right? I mean, he doesn't. And, you know, and, and aided with kind of both Pete's skill with language and with these bizarre characters. I mean, Foley is a really funny character. Like, I just can't imagine. Like, if you, that was a sitcom character, that would be one of the all-time memorable Kramer, <laughs> Super Han kind of characters. And, you know, just the fact that there's a guy named Pencils in the... Uh, that just kills me every time someone says that out loud. Sounds like a Peanuts <laughs> character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think it all comes back to Buddy, who I think is a really interesting... I don't. Do we sympathize with Bunny? Do we? Do Sometimes. we understand him? Yeah, he's I mean, really, he's um he's really racist and sexist, especially at the beginning. Like he says so much stuff that you're like, I can't believe this guy is saying this in 1992 or three. Yeah. But then when you get to Jersey, it's like Butch is always worse, you know, and like. <laughs> <laughs> and Jay and like you know, Butch believes there's a race war coming on, and he he talks he talks Jay into it, and you're like, why isn't? And Buddy's the only one with any sanity going. You guys are crazy, and Jay's talking about building a bunker for this war against the government. Um, and that's kind of I feel like the later half is when we start to take Buddy's side. I feel in the first half, the Seattle half, you're kind of you're just in there watching it with him, but. You'll notice in the second half, there's a lot more thought balloons with him saying, good grief, or oh, brother, hmm. I think, than in the first half. Or ay, ay, ay. And rolling his eyes. Ay, 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 yeah, and rolling his eyes. There's a lot more of that, I feel, in the New Jersey section than the Seattle section. Coming up, the memorable, distinct supporting characters of hate, the evolution in the comics' depictions of sex, is hate justifiably associated with the slacker aesthetic? two characters who die and how the other characters react to their deaths, and the dichotomy of what people say versus what they think. First, just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon and make that your bookmark for future purchases. We'll then get a percentage of what you spend. It costs you nothing extra and helps us cover web hosting and the other costs of presenting this show every week. We really appreciate your support. Yes? Back then? Commissioner, I tried to get you earlier. For as a great man before me has said, the rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated. It's him, all right, the Cape Crusader! He returned from beyond the pale, that's what he's done. Yes, To the Bat Poles is back. Tim and Paul return on March 15th with a brand new episode on the 1966 Batman comic strip. And our episode on the draft script of The Joker Goes to School is next up. So if you haven't gotten in your comments on the script yet, link to it from tothebatpoles.libsyn.com and email us your thoughts at batpoles at deconstructingcomics.com. Batman, Batman! I I won't waste time telling you how glad I am to have finally reached you. Please don't. It's good to be back. And now we're off. To the bat poles. But yeah, I, that uh, Tom's point is good about uh, how it is. It seems to be a kind of a remove, you know, by a, a writer who's older than the characters. Yes. Um, I had a couple of things in my notes that fit with that. Um, well, I mean, it it's clear that he uh, he's aware that he is showing us dysfunctional characters. Um, and there's one point where um, uh, Buddy and Lisa are in the car and she talks him into driving off to the bushes to have sex in the car. And 
uh, bag writes in a caption box, Great God in heaven, when will this vicious cycle be broken? <laughs> <laughs> um, and there is another part uh, I, I saw here in my notes. Um, Valerie was the way a woman should be. She was non-human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Which, you know, if if she's just human, like a, a mere mortal, then she's not really what you want. You want someone who's more of a goddess, I think, is what he's saying. But you might not yeah. be kind of in touch with that feeling when you're that age. But when you're older, you kind of realize that, right? Well, you know, Peter Peter himself, yeah, and and still does. You know, he's a he has. Um, he agrees with a lot of libertarian politics, and he was always the one guy that wore a suit and a tie everywhere, or a coat and a tie <laughs> everywhere. And he would constantly berate—not constantly berate, but like he would make jokes about um, other cartoonists in the cartooning community being children or childlike in comparison, like not quite grown up. And was always quick to needle kind of um, outlandish behavior in that way from a slightly, you know, like I said, like that, that slight reserve. And I, I don't know. It's kind of what makes him, I think it's the, I think it's the entry point and that he's just slightly different than everyone else. And you kind of adapt to figuring out that world through him. And I, that's a wonderful observation that the character definitely changes and definitely becomes less of a, um, watcher of the parade and more of a, um, participant himself and kind of and and so i yeah i mean i, I do, what did you guys think i mean do, do one george the the nerdy roommate the the black roommate um george hamilton the third i remember that character that's not a character that people come back but it's a character type that was very strange at the time um he ends up with valerie right yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but i you know that was not that was you know, everyone kind of had appreciation for those characters. And it was kind of, um, you know, stink there were stinky people that kind of liked that high energy. But there are also a number of people that really liked just how weird and kind of different that, that George was. I mean, what did you think of some of the supporting characters? Did you have favorite supporting characters that you kind of dug? Uh, I'm sure there's some Jimmy Foley people out there. I'm sure someone liked <laughs> Pencils. Um, um. <laughs> but you know the kid, Butch, the, his brother, um, the husband, uh, his uh, brother, Joel, yeah. Joel. brother-in-law, Joel. Joel. Yeah, there's some amazing kind of outlandish characters in there. Do you, did you find? Um, did any of them speak to you specifically? <laughs> I wouldn't say specifically. Like I mean, I loved every supporting character, yeah. um, and they seemed really crazy. But somehow, I there was some vibe. There was this undercurrent that these were people Bag had met. Like, mm. none of it seemed phony. Yeah. Um, I and they, they're, like they're very distinct from each other. They're, they're kind of extreme characters. And, um, like, Joel, to me, like, I was thinking about the fact that Joel ends up sleeping with Lisa and then with Babs again. And I'm yeah. like, how is this total loser? The first time we meet him again <laughs> is basically he's coming out of the woods. What was he doing in the woods? Like, Buddy's out there <laughs> camping and he emerges out of the bushes. And you're like, what is with this guy? And I don't understand how he ended up in relationships with both. And then it kind of, as I slept on it last night, I was like, actually, there was probably guys like that. And Bag probably knew that guy, like that was right. that, that total loser that was sleeping with all the women somehow. <laughs> um, sure. They were all memorable. I don't know if I don't know if I identified. You know, I strangely I feel like I don't know what I should say identify, but Lisa was so crazy, but somehow really kind of cute, and like, he kind of made her someone you kind of want to hang out with, uh, yeah. despite yeah. the craziness. There's a, um, and there's a really, like, significant character arc for her all the way through the annuals. Um, that seems like a real person to me. That seems like a real yeah. lived-in personality with the, you know, all the strangeness of the, um, like, the, <laughs> with the burlap sack and the, and the, oh. and the shenanigans <laughs> from early... <laughs> on to like the later stuff where she's going after suburban moms and at the school board or whatever. I, it she, she has a real. It's like, it's like it's almost like the strips peppermint patty, right? Which is that you can imagine um, whole features about her, um, and that's not without kind of the rest of it. It's that good of a, a character, at least in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. I I don't know, you know, it's like three dudes aren't going to be able to get into this, but I have no idea. 
if anyone under 35 and if any of kind of this legion of young um, female readers has, has read hate or what they think of those um, of his female characters, I have not seen that engaged with. But I know I, at the time, I mean, he had a very broad fan base and um, while and those in and, and those characters were not you know seen as apparent or kind of anything um odd but at least in particular i really really enjoy um well, and yeah, really really kind of the take on yeah. her in the jersey stuff in particular um really kind of spoke to me having had a family member with borderline personality disorder it kind of sounded like that and there was a really amazing scene where she and Buddy are talking about it in a really kind of unusually adult way. And uh, it, and I, I found it really uh, striking and realistic and interesting. Yeah, well, she you know, has... she's, not, she's not exactly apologetic about sleeping with Joel either, <laughs> no. right? She's like, I'm I mean, going to keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she, she, has, she has agency there and kind of um, um, admits to, to, to th liking things about that experience. Which was not exactly a pivot that a lot of people, um, you know, kind of a typical sitcom might might engage. Um, I I always get stuck with Peter because sometimes I just don't know um, how much like what he feels about those characters. I mean, I sense that there's a just the details of it and finding the humor of it is an act of sympathy on a some on some level but he doesn't spare anybody <laughs> and that is a really interesting and i you know i wonder about the tone and i wonder if the tone of it might be too caustic in a sense for for audiences to kind of deal with today it would be even today it would be a really mean television show i mean it would be a really kind of of um of talk about kind of, of, of plot progressions and, and character development. So yeah, it's, it really is surprising just how much uh, those characters kind of pop off the page. Um, and, I, and, and kind of this weird kind of, uh, not the way we usually do. We we're not asked to love any of those characters and, uh, yeah, we, by, by laughing at them, we kind of end up loving them anyway. God, Pete would kill me if I heard me say that. Please don't <laughs> let um, I, that. Yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, depictions of sex in this comic because I I saw kind of an evolution there also where in the Seattle stuff it just seems more titillating, um, but then <laughs> there are some kind of more realistic and more cringy takes on it. Well, there's one place I don't remember exactly where it was where. It really feels like Buddy is raping Lisa, although then it turns out that she wanted him to do that, but you don't know that at the time. Um, and there's another place, I know it's in the Jersey stuff, where uh, Buddy has a, is dating that friend of his sister's, and yeah. um, she's <laughs> really uptight about yeah. stuff, and the the they do have sex, but it's really kind of un an uncomfortable scene. It's not titillating at all. Yeah. Um, right. And then you get to the 21st century stuff and there just isn't any sex anymore. <laughs> right, right, right. Buddy and Lisa are married. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think that he, I, it's really um, interesting that he engages that um, material. Like, it's not like he shies away from anything or any of the unpleasant or contradictory contradictory elements. I have no idea how that would be processed by someone now. And in fact, I'd, I'd love just to, now, the one thing I'm going to come out of this podcast wanting to do is to hire some young writers and have them go back and look at this because there are some elements which are not kind of um, confluent politically with what we think of right now. You're right. I mean, there are some scenes that kind of get their humor out of pivoting away from it being um, a rape scene. Or some, you know, Lisa gets into some sick shit, um, would be another way to say that. Um, and but I'm not sure she's... how you process that politically, but I, you know, at the time it was just kind of, it was welcome to see that those characters were as weird and screwed up as, as the people I knew, right? I mean, it wasn't, it was, uh, we we're all young ones and there's all sorts of, you know, we all, they're all stories like that. My friends have stories like that. So why wouldn't these characters have story like that? So I yeah, I don't know. 
seems like a, a, a place for him to go, but I, God, I wonder how people would read that um, today <laughs> rather than in the 90s. And, and maybe Pete got off a little bit because he was so far ahead of where, you know, of comics kind of exploring this and kind of a traditional relationship pattern that you, you wonder, um, you know, people were just kind of flabbergasted and didn't know what to say. Um, like, like, um, like you said, I mean, this, it's kind of a unique comic and that it has that, um, not just the sitcom setup and not just the jokes, but the fact that like sitcoms and like Archie comics, it, kind of deals it, the the currency in which it deals is these kind of unfolding relationships and people bouncing off of each other and yeah i don't i don't know how that how that would would read now mm -hmm. but um i remember at the time there's a lot of stuff in there that seemed pretty familiar and that made me laugh um whether that makes me a worse person um uh, than <laughs> than uh, a good person i don't know um but i yeah there's he went everywhere. I mean, there's a lot of, of um, you know, just stuff in there about just like what you, it, without stating it, this kind of, um, you, I mean, you're, you can find understated stuff in there. I mean, just kind of buddy kind of trying to figure out what to do is kind of an ongoing, um, you know, he eventually ends up with his store and then later on the annual ends up with his junkyard. But that kind of, uh, drift that generational drift that people in the '90s felt is kind of evocatively and slowly and kind of deliberately played with a little bit. There, there doesn't seem to be anything worth doing, and that seems a part of it. And then when you end up in these absurd circumstances, you know, hanging out with pencils and Jimmy Foley, and trying to turn your mom's house into a crack house, um, <laughs> that seems like um, it seems like a, a, a um, potential result from kind of the the boredom and the, you know, like the nineties were like the first decade where it seemed normal for people not to be at work. Um, <laughs> you could go, like if you went to the movies in the eighties, like in the day, like if you're in a big city, like there was nobody there. Like you'd go and it'd be like you always. And it seemed like, you know, in the nineties and kind of with, um, Microsoft millionaires and all the, all, you know, all these artists and the slacker, you know, who didn't have jobs at all that there was, um, kind of a disconnect from the American dream, but it's always funny, you know, buddy ends up back in Jersey anyway and ends up in the house and yeah. So there's, there's some stuff going on there. Um, whether or not it's, it's, uh, how, how far you can dig and how deep probably depends on your time and your patience, um, for unpacking those things. But right. it's always seemed to me like a organic world, right? Like all, all really good kind of commercial art, which it, it does have its own inner logic and sense, and it does seem like because it's so lived in that you can think about kind of the actual lives of these characters as if it's not absurd um, from yeah. beginning to end. Kumar's yeah. been trying to get a word in. Let's let him talk. So I, <laughs> well, I had, a, I had a whole range of stuff uh, I can't remember. Um, one was that uh, Lisa often lies about what she says she did sexually. Uh, that's something that comes up like two or three times where she did, she says she did some crazy thing and then afterward it's like, wait, was she actually lying about that? Did she make up that story to sound crazier? Um, but the point I want to get to about the the, the work uh, and their jobs is that the word slacker is often associated with hate, but Buddy, except for when he first arrives in Jersey, always has a job. Like he's working at the bookstore and then he opens a collector's business and then he has the junkyard and he's kind of um, he's not a slacker like the other guys who are always trying to make a quick buck. And they, in fact, when he gets to Jersey and he's working at the shop, they accuse him of being rich. <laughs> yeah. uh, like he's like the he's like the the solid rock, the steady worker of all of them. He's always you know he's steadily bringing in steady income and saving. Um, so I always felt like that was kind of a mischaracterization, maybe in the 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 press quote unquote about hate and calling it a kind of a slacker comic. I think it applies to almost everybody else, but you know, buddy who was the core of the book, I don't think it was true of him at all. And I think maybe that's part of why I was able to hang around, hang on for the ride with him. Um, despite all his shortcomings is he's kind of, uh, I don't know. He's, he's trying to, 
more than anybody else, he's trying to be normal in a sense, or have that normal kind of job and work life. Hmm. Yes, I agree. I and I I think that if you, you can look at hate, it's kind of. Um, here is the, okay, we know that the culture is screwed up. Here's the counterculture, and I'm going to unpack over uh, over 30 issues how the counterculture is screwed up, too. And it's all, you know, like, uh, there's all sorts of things you're talking about that, that, that strike me as true. Not only does he work, um, Stinky is presented probably in the worst light of all of them, and he is the most slack of all yeah. of them, and kind of a schemer, and literally comes to the worst end of all of them. Um yeah. Spoiler alert, um, 30 year spoiler alert. Um, but the, uh, you know, like for instance, there's that he goes and uh, meets Val's parents, right? In an early issue. Yeah. And like there's a rich guy and she kind of expects them to, you know, fire off at longer. But like that's, that's his buddy. Like that's his instant buddy. Like he understands mm -hmm. that rich guy. He wants to have right. right. And sing country western songs. And so it was, I would say it comes from that slacker milieu rather than it's like slacker comic because it's not, it doesn't present that philosophy except maybe through Stinky. But it does come out of that kind of um, the shifting of kind of economic priorities where you just had um, kind of the old fashioned past became suspect. And you're right. I mean, one of the great things about Buddy as a character is that he ends up kind of fashioning his own way, right? Um, and really does kind of find something um admirable and not um horrible to do and that he you know and he kind of enjoys those aspects of his life um yeah so stinky hmm. yeah, yeah so well, since we spoiled the death of stinky well, can yeah, we well, talk I mean, about <laughs> in, in the intro to uh, buddy does jersey um <laughs> Bag himself spoils the death of Stinky and of uh, Buddy's dad. Um, yes, I was kind of wishing I hadn't read the intro. I mean, the the rule is always That'll... if it's if the intro is by Kevin Smith, never read it because it's full of spoilers. But I didn't expect the author himself to spoil something. But yeah, I thought that was really weird to have a character die that way, and you know, a pretty major character. Um, and then the cover-up of his death goes on for the rest of the series. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to say, it's the death uh, was super shocking at the time. Mm. Um, it's still kind of shocking because he's kind of presented as a happy-go-lucky character, but he's actually really self-destructive the whole way through. I mean, he's living this rock-and-roll life. He's always playing with guns. Um, and in fact, the first time we ever meet Stinky back in Neat Stuff, which that that stuff should be still in print. Um, yeah. But uh, he's he's shooting guns with Buddy on that very same beach where he ends up dying. Oh, yeah. You know, ten years later down the line in comics. Anyway, but um, it's kind of like a guy that destructive was never going to make it. You know what I mean? And I've heard Bag talk in interviews about how those guys were the ones that didn't make it. And it's almost, it's logical when you think about it that way. Uh, I was actually more shocked by the death of Dad because nobody seemed to care. Uh, <laughs> there's, no, there's no mourning. And until the next issue, in the middle of the issue, Mom breaks down in a panel in tears. And they're like, what are you crying about? And she's like, I just, my husband just died. And she leaves the table and Lisa's like, don't worry, I didn't know why she was crying either. <laughs> And Lisa was the one that seemed to care about it more than anybody. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, I got I got nothing there. But yeah, that's very, it, and you're right. The stinky thing is very shocking. I remember like not being able to process it on the page a little bit and flipping around like, what the hell? What the hell? What the hell is that? Is this a dream? And then like, <laughs> and, yeah, it's like I am I seeing this? Does this process? Um. But you're right, and I, you know, I think that that's, um, I think that that is um, admirable and typical that he would not spare someone for joke's sake. That it's that that you know, kind of what we talk about is the kind of, um, kind of um, uh, him not sparing characters um, just for the sake of it being happier, having a joke, or you know, he was always pretty faithful to. Um, likely outcomes, and they weren't always happy ones. Um, not that there wasn't some humor in that scene, as well as there is in all of that, but 
Yeah, wow, right? Um, and so it's, I'm, Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you're good. I was going to say, I was, I'm just looking at the page where Stinky gets shot, and it's similar to the one where Dad dies. So this is a 12-panel page, and Stinky gets shot in a little panel. He shoots himself in a tiny little panel. It's panel yeah. 8. It's like in the middle of it. There's no importance placed on the panel. And similarly, when Dad dies, it's at the bottom corner panel, or where we learn that he's died. He gets yeah, hit by a car. It Lisa tells Buddy. It's, it's just often. It's just often a tiny corner of the page. It's like there's no. There's no break of that comedic rhythm of the nine to twelve panels every page. It's always. He never deviates from that, except for you know the splash panels at the start of a story or whatever. Right. So um, do you, I mean, what do you think? Of, what do you guys think of Pete's art style? The the Bigfoot qualities of it, the super exaggerated qualities of it. Yeah, well, I, there are some I certainly liked that, the the Reed Richard stuff. Actually, I in in the interview with Coombe, he was saying that in Hate, he felt that he was sort of dialing back the Looney Tunes aspect of it in comparison <laughs> to Neat stuff. I have not seen yeah, Neat yes. stuff, but I mean, I the, certainly the way the arms bend and the way people kind of explode when they're angry with, you know, the crazy eyes and the huge head and, and the steam coming out. And I mean, that doesn't seem, I, if that's dialed back, I'd like to see <laughs> when it's not. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really uh, has some power to it. God, I love it so much. And when, especially when anyone freaks out and their eyes just become like those swirly lines and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I just love it to death. I do find it weird that he's not weird i mean he's using the same art stuff for his current stuff like the the bio stuff like the margaret sandra book it just seems a bit i don't know what quite what to make of it <laughs> um out of the context of hate or neat stuff um but it's so it but it's really controlled it's not like he can't draw an arm he just he's drawing it as a as a as a rubber band you know, it's really interesting you bring up the biographies because that is an interesting point about it. And I, I wonder if we're just past the point where people question appropriate styles and right. and things like that. That was a big deal back in the nineties and I remember the flash the kind of the flashpoint book on that was um Howard Cruz's Stuck Rubber Baby, which he drew <laughs> in a really pretty kind of super cross hatched but still very cartoony style. And I remember a lot of people just kind of not reacting well to that book because of the style selected. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine that being an issue now. You know, that's, there seems to be like a um, an almost opposite effect, kind of a, a welcoming of certain styles to depict just about anything you want, whether that's, you know, Persepolis or Mouse or, you know, any of these, any of these books kind of use these kind of out their styles. And I, I wonder if that would even be an issue. I, the writing of those Bios is interesting to me because I think that they're, um, he does use kind of that same humorous insight to humanize characters. Mm -hmm. Like the Margaret Sanger book is kind of fascinating because she's funny and it's not, Mar Margaret Sanger is not a historical character I go to for the funny. But there's something, <laughs> very, there's something very human about the way Pete depicts um, these historical characters in terms of kind of getting into the outsized um, issues of their person, uh, you know, the uh, outsides of the personality. He does seem to be kind of more openly sympathetic to these figures that he admires, um, and but using kind of the same skills that he developed as a comedian, dealing with characters that I'm not sure that he even liked at times, let alone kind of admired. So um, he's a really strong writer. So it's going to transfer a lot, um, no matter what style he uses. But yeah, those typical, you know, those bug-eyed explosions and the arms and legs going everywhere. And, uh, God, the cover of the first issue where he's in a giant truck is just an amazing-looking piece of art. Yeah. So, yeah. God bless Pete Bag's crazy drawings, and God bless hate. <laughs> Another kind of aspect of it, I, Kumar was talking about uh, how, all the thought balloons from Buddy with the I, 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 or whatever. And a lot of the time... When he's thinking that, you know, he's saying something like, it's okay, it's understandable. You know, he, it, it kind of <laughs> points out how, you know, people will not always say what they're thinking. You know, they'll try to be agreeable um, in the conversation, even if they're 
thinking why you you know in their in their head um, <laughs> that was another really kind of nice human bit to it there's a uh, there was a Peter Bag Dan Klaus collaboration short story about this dinner party and these four guests at it, um, which is really bitter and harsh. Mm. Uh, yeah. In that same like it was like that kind of thing dialed up to eleven. Uh, it was almost not funny because <laughs> it was so <laughs> extreme how hypocritical they were about what they were saying and what their actual interior lives were. Um, yeah, it didn't. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's funny because he almost like when he dates, dates that girl that Bab sets him up with. He tells her that, and it's issue twenty nine, so it's crazy late. And you'd think he'd have kind of grown up a bit, but he tells her that he likes you too. I just, I guess, just to be, just to smooth over their relationship or to keep things diplomatic. He says, "I like you too," and then yeah, she the ends up presenting him, yes. right? And she presents him with U two tickets, and he runs to the toilet and literally vomits, <laughs> and then runs out of the restaurant without telling her, and just abandons her, and then wades through this muck to escape to walk home, and he's a complete mess. And um, yeah, it's like he still kind of can't. I don't know. He's still is he worried about other people's feelings, or was he trying to protect himself? You know, if he he was worried she would get angry at him if he didn't like you too. Uh, I don't I don't know, but it's uh, it's definitely a funny thing. But I do think earlier on, I think people kind of do say what they are thinking. I think that's kind of why it gets into trouble right. a lot early on. Sure. Well, what do you what do you think of the annual stuff? I mean, I. As I was reading it, I wasn't aware of what the publication schedule was. I figured that out later from reading Wikipedia. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it remind the feel of it reminded me a little bit of the modern Sunday only Doonesbury because you're kind of just popping in oh. on it occasionally <laughs> rather than getting a nice smooth uh, sort of uh, plot. Um, well, you know, Doonesbury doesn't really have a plot anymore. It's just you know. <laughs> occasional appearances with the characters. Now, with this, there'll be a story, and there's stuff that carries over from one to the next, but, you know, you skip a lot. You know, the, you, they're just getting married, and then there's the baby, and then the kid is older suddenly, and um, I mean, he seems to be trying to keep it in real time, but it creates a different feel from the earlier stuff that was coming out more frequently. Uh, uh, you know what, right? It reminds me of kind of is like the BBC television shows that will sometimes like go off the air, but then they'll do a Christmas special like six years later. <laughs> and it's like a one shot, like a little one shot that lets you back into those characters lives. And then, you know, you're you're you know, unless they do another one, you're kind of of screwed. Um, and I always thought that, you know, the, the later the Buddy Bradley stuff just feels more, more like it, it feels more like alternate pete a little bit like this is a uh, this he's kind of building this this a uh, future light which is so different than any kind of of it just it just seems like this really interesting life that he's chosen for his main character and and perhaps um stand-in character you know it's almost like there's almost like a um a gauntlet thrown in like okay he's gonna look like like Popeye now. So like let's deal with that for a while. And so there seems to me kind of a, a, a there's a smirky kind of quality that it adds to it as the as the as the the future life becomes more calcified if that makes sense. Um but I you know I like them. I like them whenever I see them. I'd have to read a whole bunch at once to know um kind of how they connect to the older um the older stuff which I did review. Um, to talk, but I don't know. What do you? What do you? Yeah. I uh, well, my take on it is um, I think the first three or four episodes are a little bit uh, light and airy. Um, like he buys the the dump, but not much else happens. In fact, there's another there's an episode in there where he again has to babysit the kids, and uh, it's kind of a throwback to that issue we already saw earlier yeah. during the main run of hate. But I think it kind of there's an there's one where um, Lisa takes up playing the bass, and I thought that was a total riot. And mm. I think it kind of hits, and 
there's a, a pair called Heaven and Hell, and I think we start getting really back deeply into the characters when we learn about Lisa's family, and there's some kind of major plot turns. Um, so I think they got super good, uh, like the second half of those. And I think there's some really interesting continuity stuff, too, because, again, there's this character called Tom, who was back in Neat Stuff, who was a guy that Buddy used to drink in the school playground at the high school with this guy. And they would go to these parties, and they'd be driving around drunk, whatever. And uh, Tom becomes a cop, which we learn later in Hate. Yeah. And um, he has a kid, and we meet the kid in Hate. And Buddy sees him, and he's like, "This compared to Babs' kid, this kid is an angel. And he addresses his father as, yes, sir. Now, we get to a story in Buddy Buys a Dump, and that kid has hacked his school computers and been expelled, and he's become a real, he's really uncontrollable. But if you have read it all the way through Neat Stuff, there's a really interesting through line, even in these seemingly kind of throwaway dump stories, these Sanford and Son stories at the end. <laughs> uh, where these characters are still kind of developing, and if you look for these connections, you can find really interesting patterns showing up. Uh, the one thing I did find really weird was the the, the ongoing Stinky's Corpse saga. <laughs> um, to me, the the weird thing was that okay, so they they need to they need to move the corpse because Butch in it, while drinking has been bragging or I don't know blabbing about it at least. The, the yeah. fact that Stinky killed himself. So Buddy recovers a corpse around Halloween and hangs the skeleton up in his house. Now, this is the skeleton of someone he knew, of an actual <laughs> person. <laughs> try to imagine, even if it was someone you hated, try to imagine handling their bones. And also, he would have had to, like, glue them or pin them together to hang them up. Yeah, the bones don't hang so, together by themselves. I'm like, this is the, of all the things that happened in all of hate, that to me was the craziest <laughs> of all of them, was him hanging the bones and then burning them and then paving them over in his own yard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know, Peter has, I think, I don't know how much he's talked about that in public, but he has at times, I think it's safe to say, like, considered the idea of doing more sustained comics work. And I right. think that that might be something that got um, um, put aside when Kim Thompson passed, because I was an editor and someone that he worked directly with that he trusted. And, you know, in terms of uh, a specific kind of support you kind of need, I think, if you're going to do comics uh, full time. So I, I do think that there's a, maybe a consideration of, more stories, you know, with those characters, um, um, in a way that, um, the, like you're, you, that those first kind of initial coda type stories don't really, um, communicate. Cause I think that, you know, he's enough of a keen, keen mind as a writer that, um, that kind of thinking about those characters would yield, um, different results on the page. I think you're right. Um, that if he had thoughts about doing more, full-time comics with them that that would that would be a direction um yeah so there's that have either of you guys seen the animatic have you ever seen the the rough cartoon that they made no. Um, no. is it on youtube or something i i, no, I don't think so i don't think i i wonder if that i think that's not something that that gets shown or that's out there okay but you know that's you know that's the other thing i think always is worth mentioning is that there was a time at which he was headed for kind of a more Mike Judge type career, which was going to be a, a hate cartoon fully realized for MTV. And then due to some, um, depending on the story here, but definitely probably some shenanigans involved in terms of what got greenlit and what didn't, um, mm -hmm. that that was taken from him pretty late in the game. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, there's, there's a future out there, or a few, you know, alternative universe where you could imagine that stuff, you know, hitting with, you know that you know it, depending on the writing and the execution and and the animatic was of the um walking through the house the introductory kind of the first issue stuff where he, mm -hmm. he you know assist his roommates and stuff like that but it, it's not hard to imagine that stuff having a, a second kind of powerful life in animation and pete's uh, career kind of running that that show and writing for it because he was very involved um it would have been you know a different kind of um different kind of uh, end result for those characters or a different kind of public perception or at least a, a, a second life. 
And uh, some people say they can kind of see in Peter's later work like that not coming, you know, like the, there's always that question, like what would have happened if that had, had come up um, mm -hmm. earlier on. But I, you know, I don't know. I think those characters, you know, I think, I think given time to introduce those characters and to kind of, and to kind of walk through what's fun, you know, I think there, there's always an educational process, you know, like people didn't quite pick up on the Simpsons for four or five weeks, you know, four or five months. Um, and then, you know, and then they settled on Bart instead of, of Homer initially as the breakout mm -hmm. character. Um, I wonder if, if given a chance to kind of introduce and kind of, if, if his writing talent would have, and the look of the strip, um, you always wonder how that might have changed, how might, if it had broken out that way. But I guess we'll never know. Yeah. Um, any other points we want to make before we wrap this up? Well, I want to say that it's been seven or eight years since the last annual, so I guess, and it ended on kind of a cliffhanger, uh, the way the final Seattle issue ended, and I'm just wondering, what's, what's, is that it? Uh <laughs> Have we seen the the very end of Hate, or do we think it will come back in some form someday? I would love to see him just do a two hundred pager, you know. Yeah, we, and you know his. I think it's interesting. I you know he's not he's not an old man by any by any measure in terms of 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 being a writer and a cartoonist. And so his life has changed. You know his his daughter has you know is through school and married and. They have moved um, to Tacoma from Seattle. I think that's public knowledge. Kind of moved out of the the long uh, time home in Seattle. So it it seems like you know he might be up for um, a really significant third act. And the biographies kind of um, hint at the range and depth of his talent. Um, I you know I'll read anything he does. I just think he's just one of the all time. Um, great great not just a figure in american comics but a figure in american comedy because the, i just think the writing is that strong mm -hmm. um yeah so god bless him whatever he wants to do i'll i'll read and, and hope for the best <laughs> he's a good guy too um and and uh i i always hope uh you know for guys like that they do what they want and are rewarded as as immensely as possible right. for it okay yeah I will. I will also finally say I, I'm so glad we finally got to it because it is. I as I say every episode, this is one of my all-time favorite comics. But in this case, absolutely, <laughs> hate is a total top. You know, two or three for me. And I loved rereading it. It was so funny, even now. And there are some weird references in there, the like Leona Helmsley, and I'm I'm looking at going. What's any twenty-year-old going to think of that? <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know, but I every panel, every drawing, every bit of dialogue has been so perfectly crafted. It's so thoughtful, and yet it doesn't. It seems like easy. It just flows. It's so fast, um, like a river. And I just, I absolutely adored reading it again. And I laughed so hard at some gags this time. And then I was going through the books again a few days later to get ready for today and laughed at the same jokes again, <laughs> you know, just a couple days later, and it was just great. Mm. And this yeah, was like actually... Yeah, like Cat Doyle in those comics, right? I mean, it's like, <laughs> who, would, who would at this point have... A new reader wouldn't have any idea, kind of, Tad, uh, the lead yeah. singer of Tad. I, you know, I just... I, that makes me laugh that there are very specific references that I can't imagine anyone getting at yeah. this point. Hmm. And, and I was, wonder, you know, will, will that be different? Will it have will it have value as kind of a time capsule? I don't know. I know, but I think it's totally. I think people should read it anyway. Um, despite there's a oh, few yeah. little few little bits that are you know at maybe temporally locked, but um, absolutely you should read it anyway. And try to track down a tr trade paperback of the Bradley stuff because there was one, and I have it. And uh, if you can find it somewhere, get it because that's great material too. Do you know that, that issue that that where Buddy gets drunk and ends up like lying down on a yard, and yeah. the cops? Up and, I mean, that's as that's as funny and kind of right on and amazingly observed as any issue of hate that comes after. It really is kind of a proto hate issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in particular, yeah. This was actually my first time reading this or really any Peter Bag stuff, and I I liked it much more than I kind of expected to, I have to say. Mm. Um, I think I, I was expecting just kind of a raunchy underground comic, um, but it was really more of a kind of 
psychological observation of people sure. in a lot of yeah. ways. And also yes. very funny. Yeah. It's the anti Fraser. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Bagg's Hate Comics are published by Fantagraphics. Tom Spurgeon blogs at comicsreporter.com. Tell us what you think. Write us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com or contact us through social media. Find all the links on the right sidebar at deconstructingcomics.com. We're also on the Comics Podcast Network at comicspodcasts.com and on comiccon.com where our new episodes appear on the Friday before they show up in the feed. Also, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio, or wherever you find podcasts. We really need more listeners to give us reviews and help us stand out from the many comics podcasts that are out there. Our theme is from bensound.com. Once again, don't forget to help support the show with a pledge at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Next Monday on Critiquing Comics, Mulele and I critique two more submissions. Jinx, a comic that may owe something to the old Chinese stories about the Monkey King, and Dark Soul, which shows heavy influence from Japanese gangster comics. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. Thank you.